It's had a considerable impact uh, on most community activities over the last two years. So to close this session today, Cyber Scotland Connect is going to host this short session looking at the effect on the local security community. So I've already introduced them, but I'll do it properly. Stu Hurst is CISO for Trustpilot and a CSC moderator. And Harry McLaren is a senior product manager for Senson and is also a CSC moderator. Um, I'm going to hand. I'm going to sit where I am here because I can't be bothered moving. But um, I'll leave it up to them. So, gentlemen, thank you. Thank you. Uh, right. So, good afternoon. We uh, recognise the fact that we are all that stands between you and your homes, slash possibly <laughs> some alcoholic refreshments. So, we will try and be brief. And we will also try and be to the point, because I think that's the most important thing when talking around these topics. Um, yeah, my name is Harry McLaren, Senior Product Manager and Squad Lead at Senson. We build cybersecurity software for detection and response. Um, and Stu? There you go. Yeah, that's me. That's Stu. <laughs> um, we essentially started to found, oh, actually, sorry, Q&A first. So for those at home on the live stream and those uh, in the audience, we will take audio Q and A at the end, but if you prefer to be kind of anonymous and submit it on Slido, go to slido.com, type in CSC and you'll be able to submit questions as we go. We'll be able to review them and uh, we'll shout them out at the end or you can wait for the mic. Cyber Scotland Connect um, established itself about four years ago. It was squashing together of two community organizations based in Edinburgh that uh, Stu had founded and that I had founded kind of separately. We both kind of went to each other's and went, well, this is maybe a little silly. Let's pull our resources together. And we had some brilliant support from other leaders throughout the cybersecurity community. And CyberSpot Connect was born. Um, our mission there is fundamentally just about bringing people together. It wasn't to kind of swallow any other communities, but it was to support, signpost, and hopefully, you know, when missions made sense, work together with vendors, supporters, and other community groups. Um, our values are super important to us. All of our events and all of our kind of initiatives are, are very judgment-free. We try and ensure that our environments are welcoming, where there is no harassment, we have a code of conduct, et cetera, et cetera. So, in-person events, absolute yay. Uh, Stu especially, I know, is particularly excited to be in person again, as am I, even though it's nerve-wracking. Although quite an extrovert before the pandemic, it turns out that crowds are terrifying these days. And the same kind of goes for Cyber Scotland Connect. So we're sitting there, as everyone was, and without going into the details of the pandemic, it's been awful for many reasons, and many have it worse off than us. But we're sat there kind of going, OK, you know, we've got this community. We had, I think, 1,500 members. Our events were always kind of sold out, whether they were virtual or otherwise. And then suddenly the pandemic hit off. No in-person meetings, which is where we flour flourished. That's the word. Um, but we still managed to do some things. So we managed to host six events throughout the pandemic, so that might actually be seven. Um, we covered uh, initially kind of riffing on it, a lockdown special, ah, okay, we're locked down, but everything's fine, not so fine. Um, cyber confessions, that was super interesting. That was kind of a, a effed up nights theme where people shared stories about cybersecurity and IT, where they'd made mistakes and what they learned from them. We did a break into cyber to try and support those either coming through the kind of standard pipeline of colleges and universities, or indeed those trying to move laterally from other domains, IT or otherwise. That was really interesting. Um, challenges and triumphs. So we've now at this point spent a year in lockdown and things had gone well in some areas and not so well in others. So we shared some lessons learned there. Um, it's got secure last year. It was virtual, but it was still a really good event. We hosted some workshops where we tried to kind of use Zoom and a mixture of kind of, you know, virtual whiteboards to try and get things working together as far as solving some complex problems. It was interesting to say the least. Um, and then finally, we did lessons from working in cyber through the pandemic. And that was last year. And this was us by, by winter, I think, for many reasons. And Stu is now going to talk us through some of the kind of finer details on that, and then we're going to summarize um, what's next. Cool. Thank you, Harry. Um, it's been so long since I've talked in person, I have notes. I've never had notes for a talk in my entire life, so bear with me. Um, it's great to be back. I'm having to get used to a clicker again and real people and the same as everything, uh, same as everybody else. Um, this might feel like therapy a little bit, but I think there's quite a lot to learn from what we've sort of collectively been through in the last two years of trying to run a community and keep it, um, keep it going. So 
I think I'm going to touch on some themes here that most of you will, um, will feel familiar with. Uh, initially, when the pandemic kicked in, there was this sort of collective social spirit, not, not just in, in kind of wider society, but um, the cyber community as well. Um, but that felt like it went away quite quickly. I don't, I don't know if that resonates with, with people in the room. Um, I don't think it was ever quite meant to last this long, and I don't think human beings are particularly set up to, um, to, to deal with those things for that period of time. Um, so obviously everything went online, right? So we're not just, not just our day jobs in tech, our social lives went online. I mean, how many people were sat in their virtual pubs on a Saturday night? I mean, I know I was for, for a few weeks. But that became quite tiring. You know, the separation between day job behind a screen at home and then social life behind a screen at home. Uh, you know, and everything else kind of, kind of behind this, uh, this screen. Um, you know, Cyber Scotland Connect thrived on in-person things, whether they were meetups or, or workshops or, or, or gatherings. Uh, so, you know, we struggled a little bit. Um, Harry mentioned the Scott Secure uh, thing from last year. So we've been with Scott Secure for a few years now, doing workshops which have worked really well. Right. So rooms of clever people um, talking about problems and, and how to solve them. We tried to replicate that last year uh, as best we could. Um, and I guess one of the things that I noticed first off was cameras off. I think I had 12 people in my room and only three people put their cameras on. Um, I guess you're still in your pajamas or uh, uh, whatever. Um, so it's really, really hard to replicate those things that we'd been successful at. Uh, so I felt like there was a virtual fatigue kicked in fairly, fairly quickly. Well done if you can spot 1980s seminal rock band White Snake there. Uh, looking out for number one, when I was thinking about kind of just that journey and all the, the craziness of those first few weeks and months, two years ago, what I'm sure we all felt in this position was the first thing was to look after number one, right? Is, is my job safe? Is my family safe? You know, my, my, my health and, and uh, the things of those around me. Um, I think I very quickly pivoted to, I just need to focus on my day job. That's what pays the mortgage. That's what put food, puts food on the table. So capacity for anything else, frankly, just disappeared reasonably quickly. Um, that heightened stress of uncertainty and fear that you know, may still be around for some people, there's only so much our brains can, can comprehend. Um, you know, childcare, all those issues that, that I'm sure we've, we've all struggled with. Um, I also questioned a couple of times, do I... Do I want to do this anymore? I know that sounds a bit strange because I'm so passionate about it, but you know, is there just so much going on right now for, for who knows how long that can I can I even be bothered? You know, to, to a certain extent, um, you know, quite quite difficult thoughts to uh, to deal with. Fear. I think I, I, we've all gone through uh, various stages of fear. I'm sure. Um, one of the things that hit me quite early on was. was is this what the future is going to be like now? Am I comfortable with what this is becoming? Everything's gone virtual and I like some of it and I don't like other parts of it. Have I lost elements of what I enjoy doing in my industry, in my community? Um, is it always going to be this way? Are we ever going to get back to in-person events? Is that what people feel comfortable with? With all the hard work that Harry and I and the moderators and, and a great group of people in this industry in Scotland, would it be undone um, through, through what was happening? Um, I guess I've worried the last year or so about how long it's going to take society to recover from this and move on and, uh, and hopefully get back to what we love doing. And it's great to see so many people here today um, looking to, to get back to that too. Engagement, I mean, you know, we have Slack channels, we're on Twitter. Um, you know, that definitely died down in terms of chat. Again, people's capacity for conversation changed very quickly. Um, definitely more fractious online conversations um, you know, during, a, during a tough time for people. You know, that, that definitely um, played its part. Um, our moderators went, went quiet, you know, as to be expected for all of us. Um, you know, some haven't returned. Some of our moderators have decided that they, they, they don't want to carry on. That's absolutely fine. You know, they, they have uh, their own things to, to deal with. So that, that was a concern. Um, yeah. <laughs> then we had kind of more practical concerns. So we've never been a, 
a community organization that, you know, we, we don't have an income, right? There's no budget. Um, the, the places that we've used for events have been willing to host us for, for free. You know, they take the hit on the, on the beer and the pizza and the soft drinks and things. Um, now, we lost one of those major ones already because they've downsized their office and we've lost that, that space. Um, companies don't have the budgets anymore or, or yet to, to recover some of those budgets to do those things. Um, and then even as things have started to become possible again, did we want to start kicking off events where there'd be all sorts of health and safety concerns and, and you know, restrictions still, still going? Um, you know, we need to kind of re-explore what's, what's possible. So, as you can see, we've sort of tried to navigate a very fraught set of personal and uh, external circumstances. It's been a, a time of real disruption and, and stress. Um, and I don't feel our experience of, of running the community or trying to run the community will have been too different from the experiences you've all, you've all gone through over the last couple of years. Um, so we'd love to hear your, your thoughts, your learnings. You know, we're, we're a community-based initiative, so it's about, about all of us. Um, but I feel like we've entered 2022 with renewed optimism and energy, um, and I feel like we're ready to re really reinvigorate that community again. Um, so I'm going to pass on to Harry for what's next. Thanks, Steve. So the, the way Cyber Scotland Connect has always been structured is the idea is that all of our, quote, leaders are emergent leaders. They're community leaders that have simply said they're willing to help. Um, we have no kind of hierarchy outside of moderators help moderate the community. They help moderate it to the values that we have distilled from the community. They help moderate the events, the initiatives, the activities we do from the community. And with that being the case, we've often discussed, well, what else could we be? You know, there's a, we've built kind of a platform. We've got two years ago. Two years ago, great attendance at our events. Are there other things we could do? Are there other challenges in our organization we could help solve or help meet the needs of people other than just kind of sharing events and you know, having beer and pizza nights, which is an important need? Um, so things we discussed, we discussed, oh, should we do mentoring? We had people ask us, oh, how would, how would I find a mentor? And we're like, well, could we facilitate? Could we build a library of mentors? We multiple times did panels and talked about mental health and burnout, which is prevalent and a significant challenge in our industry and rarely talked about even today. We had people suggest that we should exclusively be virtual and that it improved our accessibility for those that either were too socially anxious to come to a large event with 100 people or that physically couldn't. And that was a really good point as well. We had others that said virtual events were awful and they would never come unless it was in person. Um, and then we had others just go, well, why don't we just have these continuous asynchronous conversations and threads? And essentially, we just had a whole bunch of great ideas, but we've not had a whole bunch of direction of what's more important. And so today, we're essentially using this as a bit of a call to arms or call to action. Cybersquat and Connect was always a collection of some of the cyber, cyber community in Scotland, mostly Edinburgh-centric, but there is a whole, mu there is a much larger community out there that we want to reach. There is a huge amount of people that have never even been to any of our events and don't know who we are, and they can help. And so this is a, an ask to, to you and to anyone that's listening and watching this, is that if you want to be part of that change, whether that is simply as a member of the community to suggest what you need or you think's best for others, we want your feedback. And if you are someone that thinks they can step forward into that kind of more moderator role as an emergent leader of the community, we also want your support. We want your insights. Um, we want your contacts. We want to be able to use your conference rooms, possibly for an event. You know, we want to leverage you and everything that you are for the betterment of the cyber community in Scotland. And so as we draw to a close, I think this is another one of your, your memes. Um, but yeah, um, essentially, this is how we'd like you to reach out. We'd like you to come to us in person. We'd love to, to meet you later on. But we'd also really like you to fill out a survey for us. This is incredibly light. Um, it'll be on our Twitter. It's on our website. Um, that QR code is safe, I promise. But if not, there is a full URL you can type in. Don't worry. Um, 
And this survey is a, it's a Google form. It should be more than five minutes. You don't have to leave your personal details if you don't want to, only if you want to be reached out to. So you can get your feedback in anonymously too. But the idea is, is that we, we, we need your direction. We don't want Stu and I sitting here or some of the other moderators just being like, you know what, we should just do that, and we should just do that. It's like we could do those things, but we don't want to spend our time only doing things that we think are important. Um, that introduces a lot of biases. It introduces our bubble being mostly Edinburgh-centric. We want to do what the Scotland side community thinks is important. And those members that aren't based in Scotland, we still want your insight too because you're part of the broader information security family, right? Um, and yeah, I think some closing comments there. Anything yeah, to add? My chance for some final thoughts to a room of people for the first time in a while, and I appreciate it before Mark uh, wraps up. Um, wow, what a mad two years, right? I'm sure we don't um, wish to repeat most of it. Um, it's tested us and it's tested our cyber community. Um, my overriding feeling now is one of recovery in every sense. Um, the thriving community we once had only took a partial back seat um, and it's there to pick back up and drive forward. Um, we're the ones that drive innovation, the ones that bring amazing new talent into this industry, uh, that nurtures it and takes it to the next level. All of you, all of you in this room, we all do that. So we can sit and lick our wounds, or we can go again with determination and energy. Um, let's not forget that our industry thrives on resilience, that R word, not the other R word you're not allowing me to say today, um, on picking itself up after bad things happen. Um, don't forget also, and I genuinely believe this, right, and I have for many years, the Scottish cybersecurity is one, if not the best in the world, really, because I haven't seen a better one anywhere else. Um, so I really, really believe that. So finally, let's, let's really enjoy that reconnection. Um, and just last thought, I want to thank Ray, Mark, all the team, everyone at, at, at Digit. Um, they've handled this last two years incredibly well. They've pivoted. They've kept themselves going. They've been at the forefront of getting these things back on, giving us an opportunity to talk again and, and bring other great, great speakers back to, to rooms. So well done to all, all of you for, for putting on, and thank you all for being here. Um, thank you very much. Cyber Scotland Connect, I mean, it, it's, you know, I can see what the purpose of it is, or rather was. Um, was there without Cyber Scotland Connect what you might describe as a cyber community, and I'm, I'm asking the audience this, was there a, a cyber community prior to COVID? You know, did you meet up? What were, what were the forums? How did it, how did it actually operate? Because I'm, I'm, I'm hazy on the subject. I'm not an industry insider. Can somebody explain that to me from the floor? I, hang on, wait, wait. It's about time Pete did something for his money. <laughs> hang on, right. <laughs> Get on my microphone. Go on. I'm, I'm going to let others answer, but I'll just say the guys know better than me. There's different communities. I mean, there was, you guys had the big ones. There's like 2,600. There's, there's lots of little different communities you meet up. That's all I'm going to say because I've said too much today. <laughs> no, no. It's okay. <laughs> but that, that was when Harry and I sort of got together to, to think about doing this, what, five years ago or something now, it was because there were lots of great disparate things going on, but almost nothing somewhere in the middle where all those things could connect, <laughs> obviously, hence the, hence the name. It's like, how does OWASP know that DEF CON's doing something? How do you share speakers, mentors? How, you know, can we share, connect companies that are recruiting? Just something in the middle that isn't a company, you know, we're not, we're not doing anything for profit, but just can get all those things talking to each other. That was the idea, and that, sort of, that, that still is, really. So, yes, lots of stuff was going on. And there was different, like, there was, like, oh, as you say, application hacking, and then, yeah, the other ones, like, ISC squared, more kind of governance and, and stuff. So, yeah, there was different I, things for different folks. The amount that, of people I was, sorry, 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 and I was about to say, that kind of thing that was happening two years ago, is it still happening? You know? Well, sorry, I mean, oh, I've got a microphone to you at the front. The Here you come. <laughs> No, it's just so everyone can ask you there to was you. always stuff going on at the informatics building at the university that included cyber and at Harriet Watt um, with that well-known professor whose name escapes me at the moment. Bill um, Buchanan. Yes. Yeah. And then, How and the then, hell could you forget Bill <laughs> Buchanan? <laughs> and, then, uh, and then Codebase. So I guess, well, to me, that's, and I'm kind of outside of it, but that's, these are the disparate ones that, I'm aware of that yeah. we're running events. Okay.
That's I've nice. always met people at events. The, the business um, school as well at the university. Yeah, the amount of people I speak to or did speak to previously in person at events would, would articulate something similar. It's like, hey, I know this thing's going on here and I'd have never heard about it. Or some, uh, uh, so all these great things happening in what's quite a small ecosystem in Scotland, but people genuinely hadn't heard of these things going on. So that to me felt like the problem to solve. How can we be the conduit to people finding out that all of these other great things are going on? Okay. Yeah, the, the mission was to host our own kind of general purpose events, if you will, that could be any topic. As I said, we covered mental health and burnout. We would go deep into malware reverse engineering. We had open mics where up and coming presenters that hadn't perhaps spoken before would get to have a limited audience to present to the first times. But then the other part was the signposting and the going like, oh, great, or, you know, there are all these student led societies that do great work and some of them have open sessions where anyone can come there's the you know certificate bodies and member organizations bcs ic squared isaca uh, etc that also do their own but again it was yeah it's, there were pockets and the idea was to try and be a um something that could signpost to all of them and also hopefully gain their support in in the mission um, and many of them signed on as as partners uh, you know isaca ic squared bcs four out of five universities, all of them are, quote, official, you know, partners of Cyber Scotland Connect. What we've failed to do, largely because of the things we've discussed, is take advantage of those partnerships. And that's because of the, the fatigue, that's because of the, the kind of lack of engagement. There's a huge amount of potential. What we need to do better is understand what our, essentially our strategy is, where are we heading, and who's going to help us get there. Again, as an outsider, can I just point out, you are not alone. You know, every industry is doing exactly the same thing. There are people I work with directly in the BBC who are experienced interviewers. You know, people who have spent their entire lives going out and yapping to somebody face to face, and they just don't want to do it. You know, there are serious concerns post-COVID. People are still nervous. They're still a bit sort of, you know, just uncomfortable with the idea of coming face to face with people. It's just, I think, going to take time. Pure and simple, you know, and it's 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 something that it's going to need to be worked on. But time, I think, is the, is the healer eventually. Yeah, I think time comes into it. I think some people's needs have changed somewhat permanently. Some yeah. people's needs have just never really been met before, and now suddenly we're all worried about them. You, you see this a lot with employment. You know, oh no, everyone's got to be in the office. Oh, isn't that funny? Suddenly everyone can work from home, and yeah. they're just as efficient. That's interesting, you know. So I think it's also like canvassing the community and trying to make sure that you actually have a diverse data set of needs and wants and aspirations to direct strategy of an organization, even yeah. like us. What I found interesting was we were probably one of the worst, first and worst, if you like, um, events that we actually streamed our events and have, have not done for a number of years, haven't we, with Product Forge. Yep. Um, at the back. Yeah, there, yeah, there you go. Hello. Shout out to the awesome Product Forge team. But I had to reach out a few weeks ago to even find out if they still existed and if they were still kind of doing these things. Thankfully, they are. But that was just another sort of complex thing. Where I'm like, oh, God, I didn't even think that maybe that was still a thing. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, it's, yeah, we built those partnerships up, and then it's kind of dissipated over this, this period of time through no fault of our own. And now we're just, we're just well, reconnecting, picking it back up, going again, trying to invigorate people. What's the plan? The, the, the idea of remote working, or working from home, is obviously not a new one. Um, but the, the son of a very good friend of ours, youngest son, uh, who's a, always has always been a cocky little sod, um, and he worked for the. He was quite senior in the Bank of America, um, and he'd been working in America, and he came back to work in this country, etc. And he was based in London, um, and he told the Bank of America that he was an hour and a half away from his office, which was very true, by plane. He lived in Edinburgh, basically, and because it was America, nobody really knew about it. But there's still, you know, some companies are having this pressure to push people back into offices, and the trouble is, distance has given us all perspective. We've all stepped back and taken a look at what has been going on and thinking, well, actually, do I need to do that? Do I want to do that? Is there a better way of doing this? Why are you forcing me to go back into the office if I don't want to? And the answer is, obviously nuanced it's for yeah. some cultures face to face is going to be the way you know if you're trying to mob a problem there's probably nothing better than all being in a room in front of a whiteboard however if you are sat there coding if you're sat there dealing with you know call after call after call 
is there a difference from being at Teams at home or on Teams in the office? You know, it depends yeah. on the business, their model, and also bearing in mind it only applies to knowledge workers. There's a whole sector of multiple industries that just can't appreciate what it's like to do that. And um, we often kind of forget their needs and all this too. And if, you know, for the last two years, there'll be a, a stack of people that have come into the industry in this country who won't have known any differently other than working virtually and not going to in-person events. So do we cater for that long term? Do we try and I mean, I don't have the answers to that, but you're already going to have two years' worth of entry people into this industry who haven't come to meetups, they haven't come to Scott Secure, they haven't, they haven't had that experience. Do they want it? You know, is it something, you know, so there's all these complex things to try and solve in the coming months and, yeah. and years. Can we get a microphone to that gentleman at the back, please? Put his hand up. Somebody reminded me the other night of you know, the Saturday night Zoom quiz. Oh, God, I'd forgotten about the Saturday night Zoom quiz. My favourite one was the fella, he was, he was 83 years old, who'd compiled the quiz, and he submitted it along with the answers. It was the fastest one we ever did, and we all got it right. Jen, sorry, carry on. Hi, thank you. Um, just, just going back to the point about uh, all the disparate groupings in the inform information security space uh, before COVID and, and still now, uh, both Harry and Stu know that I'm not an infosec person, I'm a business continuity person for my sins. And uh, I, I know, uh, as well as many of you will, that there's lots of other pr protective and responsive risk disciplines out there and other professions that we have to work closely with. The amount of times that I've heard in this conference about we need to be better at communicating risk, well, there's communication prof professionals out there, or we need to be doing third-party supplier, well, actually, there's procurement and supply management professionals out there, as well as all the business continuity, the risk management, the governance. How does this question, so here's my question, how does this community get better at not just being an infosec community, but partnering with other risk disciplines and other professions in these types of meetups so we can actually share learning across our silos? I guess by members of the community asking hard questions like that and getting the leaders of it to pivot and try and meet that need. Because you're right, you know, generally speaking, cyber-based communities do tend to be, and I say tend to be, it's not all of them, quite insular. We focus on our problems as the way we understand them, and we formulate solutions based within that bubble. And that's not good for anyone. We, we need diverse solutions and diverse descriptions of the problem space to, to hope to solve them. And so that, to me, as a, quote, community leader, is a need now that's unaddressed. And what the rest of the cyber community that wants to be involved with CyberScot Connect needs to do is, do you agree? Because we're not here to say, I think that's a great idea. I think that's something that we should talk about and we should build, you know, get talks, get presenters in to talk about, etc. But if the rest of the community disagree, well, that's where I can only suggest and I have to be a good custodian and do what the community wants. So if you agree with that, which I suggest a good case has been made why, you know, let us know that too, because that will give us a good reason and a good top three priorities of like, one of our three priorities, we need to partner with more non-cyber specific organizations, communities to bring in this diversity of thought. I may be reading too much on what the, just, the gentleman just said there, but I, I, from my perspective, I genuinely think just about every industry is crap at communicating with everybody else. It's just not something we naturally want to do. We like being little tribal units. We like having our own languages. We like having our own interests and things like that. And we're not terribly good at sharing. Really? Yeah, I agree. Sounds okay. accurate to me. Hi, Mark. That's very, very relevant, actually. I, as a, I guess, a lot longer in this industry than I now like to think, my name's Alistair Benny, I'm a CIO with uh, a spin-off from Scottish Government. Um, one of the things that we need to be better at is at leaders. Not tech, but leaders. It was summed up in the plenary this morning about uh, how we need to be thinking about bringing people into our industry that are not tech-focused, that are looking at other ways of engagement, other ways of working. And I think that's really, really important. I've worked in this industry for 30 odd years. I have no formal training in IT at all, other than the things I've gone off and done myself. I didn't do IT at university. I've done no formal uh, courses, etc., other than those I needed to do my job. But I consider myself a reasonably proficient tech expert both in architecture, security, and other elements. But 
The things that I appreciate, and I think my colleagues appreciate, is an understanding of business and business interaction, business leadership. What value am I giving back to a business at any time? And we as, our, as leaders have a responsibility to mentor and coach people in our industry to reach those levels of, of uh, skill and engagement. So for me, my responsibility is helping people in this room get to that level. Mm. Okay. Sounds like, an, in my mind, another community need. You know, you're identifying a problem space, you're identifying a gap, and you're suggesting that multiple people stand up to help solve it. And I think that is exactly what we're asking. You know, that to me is another quote priority that if the Saudi community want it, let's facilitate it and let's make sure that we're encouraging other leaders and in some cases possibly light, likely dragging them to help meet that need. You know, because there's a difference between kind of leading internally and being prepared to, to lead within a community. It's, it, it can be very intimidating. You can say, oh, well, I'm not a great speaker. I don't make great slides. It's like none of that actually matters if you've got the willingness and hopefully then surrounded by other people that are trying to lead that can help you as a leader as well, if that makes sense. Dennis, did yeah. you anything? I mean, I don't want to suggest that events have to be back in person fully again. We're in this nice hybrid model and that will continue to evolve. But I think what you've brought up there is something that I see historically, and today's a great example of, these are great questions that generates chat now, of which loads of us will go and have a beer and a, or a coffee and, and chat upstairs. That generates the connection and the chat and the, and, the, and the next stages. When we did those workshops last year, as great as Scott Secure was last year as an event, we really struggled to have that level of chat. That people just weren't asking those questions, and it didn't generate the follow-on afterwards. So I feel like the reconnection of people in person again is the thing that's going to drive a lot of that, albeit not exclusively. You know, we have these other mechanisms now to communicate with each other. But um, this yeah. back to your thing about people. Sorry, I will get, nobody else can hear if you don't get the microphone. So here you go. Hi, this goes back to about talking about people working in the office, and especially the ones you said about the ones that started in the last two years, is they don't get that um, peer learning or anything like that. And it's the same with these events. You found it. I mean, I was probably one of those ones with the camera off in the, in the uh, workshops last year. But you, you, I, I think there needs to be more of the, these events coming back. And what you offer is brilliant, especially in person events. I mean, I mean, I'm sitting here with a mask on. But there's no way you can get as much information as you can do today. I mean, even the vendor stands and stuff like that. Um, at the online events, you, you can click on their booths, you look at it quickly, but when you actually get talking to the guys, it's so much better. Yeah. So it'd be, it'd be a shame to lose what you had before. I don't know, you know Mark said, you know, time is the healer. Maybe we just need another, you know, six months. We're, mm -hmm. we're really actually quite early in on this recovery. Mm -hmm. And that what you were doing was not wrong or, or bad. It's just, we just need more time to... I think so. Uh, you know, I I mean, some of my slides there about some of the complexities and problems of the last two years are obviously focusing on a lot of the negative. I mean, there have been positives, obviously. You know, the ability to pivot very quickly to virtual events, even just to have a streaming capability, and they're great, right? And we can take those forward, but there's so, there's so much added value in this in-person thing. And I agree with the office thing as well. Yeah. It's great that we offer opportunity and choice now as to how people get their work done but I've definitely seen that being back in an office as yeah. well that the side of desk conversation the, the, the coffee at lunchtime it's, it's not for it's, everybody right it's but the random chat and they got you know, I think so sort of stuff, I think but, so you know the ad hoc questions and things yeah this is not I'm genuinely this is not a funny question I'm, I'm curious pure and simple why did you have your camera switched off uh, I might have done <laughs> might have done <laughs> why would you have done let me rephrase the question uh, I don't know I just might be being shy or just, you know, want to just listen in. I mean, coming to these events where you're, you know, yeah. there's what, 70 or 80 people in here uh -huh. and only five will ask a question. When you're doing the workshops and you've got a screen that's all laid out, you can see exactly every single person. And, you, you know, you don't know who, who's going to be suddenly asked a question or whatever. Whereas in a crowd of 70, yeah. 
you can yeah. do it. When Harry and I were two minutes before getting, getting up to talk, Harry said, I'm really nervous for this, you know. And I was nervous as well because as comfortable as I am speaking to people, I've only ever seen people on a screen when I've been talking for the last two years or pre-recording something that I can then re-record if I screw it up. And now it's like I can see people's body language. I can look you in the eye as you, as you respond. I can see what's resonating, what isn't resonating. I, I can't replicate that on screen generally. So as exactly. great as that's all been to pivot and to have the, the, the virtual thing, there's so much more around body language and connection. I keep repeating myself. So no, too straight. <laughs> the gentleman at the back, the, you've been very patient. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> um, I'm uh, my name's Rob Ninch. I'm uh, head of governance and compliance for a company called iSystems, who are based down in Kent. Uh, during lockdown, I actually moved from Kent up to Ayrshire, um, and I kept my job which was fantastic. Um, I, I find all this discussion about lockdown and how people have been um, in and out of the office and so on really very, very interesting because I worked in a hybrid, if you want to call it that, situation for probably about five, six years bef before lockdown happened. So I would go into the office a couple of days a week. I'd have three days at home. And there was benefits to both, because when I was working at home, I got a hell of a lot more work done, because nobody was disturbing me, and I could get my head down, and I could go through a policy document or you know, BCP or whatever really quite easily. But what you were talking about, the body language, I've done webinars during lockdown, and it's not the same as standing there and seeing your audience and watching their eyes and knowing when you've lost them, knowing when you've got them back into your hand, knowing when you need to say something funny or tell a story or whatever. Um, and I had the choice of, do I do this at home today or do I travel from Ayrshire to here to be here? And I want the interaction. I wanted to be able to go up in the hall like the last guy was saying. You know, I wanted to see what was on the stands, and I wanted to see the speakers, and I wanted to actually physically be here, because I like that interaction. And I think we will get back there, but I think the hybrid that you're talking about is where things will, will go and probably stay. And as someone who's lived that for about five or six years, it's actually a really good balance. Yeah. Yeah, to totally agree. That's how most organisations seem to be setting themselves up now, to cater for, for the needs of its, its workforce far better than it, than it had. But I agree, we could talk a lot today about what the last two years has done from a cyber community point of view and, and how people have craved some normality of these kind of things. I can feel it, I can sense it in the room, you know. Turnout's been brilliant and, and there'll be lots of follow-on conversation. Um, I, don't, I don't think we should be too uncomfortable about talking in those terms. You are, as a group, a subset of society, and, and you, you, you are, you're not immune from everything that you've been affecting wider society. It's, it's exactly the same for everybody else, essentially. I, I, last week, I went to the inauguration of a national COVID memorial. I was talking to people there who had either lost loved ones or were living with long COVID, etc. Um, and to, to turn that into a podcast, I actually got some clips sent up of news archive. Um, and, you know, the, the, the one phrase that came out of it was, you know, forget all the gibberish that Boris Johnson comes out with. You must stay at home. You must stay at home. We had the bejesus scared out of us. We were told, you go out, people will die. It's very, you know, we've been trained to do a certain thing. It is only two years down the line. It's going to take a while for that to release and for people to relax and for people to feel comfortable again. So I take entirely your points, sir. You know, it, it's, there, is, there is a need for human physical contact, but we are wary of it and understandably wary of it at the moment. So yeah. it's going to take a while for your community Look, to I, fire back up again. I think I talked in that final little bit there around just recovery in general, right? That's yeah. going to mean a lot of thing, different things to different people. Physical, mental, community, you know, the, the security world that we all work in. There's, there's all these different levels to it. But yeah, you're right. It'll take, it'll take time. Yeah. I think the key is, similarly to this morning when we were all asked, you know, what we're comfortable with and having a visual way of displaying it, the same must apply to the workplace, and the, ideally, and the same must apply to our communities and our society. You know, it's, it needs to be far less kind of binary of, you know, like, 
are all one COVID protective measure useless or not and shouldn't everyone be back to handshakes by now and why isn't everyone back in the office and instead should be like well wait a minute what actually matters does it harm me if a person is doing and behaving in a more you know risk averse way than I am well, no, but I don't know why. I don't know. Maybe they're allergic to the vaccine. I don't know anything about them. And so it's much better to assume the best of them and the best of, you know, our society than it is to assume the worst and, you know, get all tribal and judgmental. There are, of course, lines at either end of that extreme. I'm not suggesting it's complete free-for-all, but... You know, I think you know, today has been a great example of that, of people being given the autonomy to make an informed decision, whether that is to listen at home for whatever reason, or whether it's to come in person and engage in a way that they feel comfortable going. And it's been great seeing people respect those boundaries throughout the day. And I think as, you know, back to the time piece, hopefully that's not just a COVID measure and that's something that we can embrace much, you know, much further down into the future. Because I think actually, those behaviours are much more conducive to a more respectful society anyway. That, that, that was a much better way of expressing what I tried to say first thing this morning when we were talking about masks and things. Um, I think these are a great idea. Personally, I'd like everyone, you know, if, if, if you could go into the railway station, the bus station, the bank, whatever it was, and there were three bowls, you know, with a green badge, an orange badge, and a red badge, I would welcome it 100%, and you can wear them all the time, and it means that I can walk up to you. I don't know what your medical history is. I don't know if you're living someone with complex medical needs. But if you're wearing a badge that's red, I know not to put my hand out and shake because there's that awkward social dynamic for a start because I don't know you. I'm, you know, I'm getting some for Christmas going home to the family. I think it's, 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 seriously, yeah. I think it's a crap. I've got the red on. Don't mention politics. Don't mention anything <laughs> else. Food is. If it's an amber, we can maybe stretch to COVID. Yeah. If it's a green, it's free for all. That's, that's I, to funny. be honest, I think it's... Christmas, you have to mention politics. It's the law. But no, if I've got my red lanyard on. Well, well that's fine. That's fine. Reasonable. Listen, can I ask you to thank Stu and Harry one more time? <laughs> just give me a minute or so of your time, folks, if you wouldn't mind, because I'd just like to thank all of our speakers today. It has been a very different experience having this, literally with people in the room. Um, and it's worthwhile pointing out, I think it's correct in saying, Pete, that this is the last one that's going to be a hybrid event. In future, they're basically going to be live events, but we will record what's happening and they will go up on a YouTube channel afterwards. Um, the exhibition area is going to remain open until five o'clock. Um, I need to thank our cons partners, exhibitors and sponsors as well. Take the chance to meet the, the sponsors if you can. It's the last chance to enter the competitions and win prizes. Um, Digit will recycle these badges, so leave them at the registration desk and leave them in the venue. There's going to be pizza and beer upstairs in the stratosphere. Stay and join them if you can. Um, there is a conference survey. There's always a conference survey. It's not a, just it's a paperless exercise. It's not just an exercise for the hell of it. You know, Digit use this to try and improve, to try and refine, to try and, and, and sort of move on with what they're actually doing on a, on a month by month basis. So it has a real value. There's a £50 Amazon voucher, a chance to win a £50 Amazon voucher. The, the survey will be sent to you by email tomorrow or it's accessible now on the virtual conference platform. The next five events are all going to be live. Uh, they are Data Protection Summit, Thursday the 24th of March, Digit, that's tomorrow, Digit Leader Summit, 28th of April, Marketing Technology, Technology Summit, 10th of May, Digit North, Aberdeen, the 19th of May, and the Cloud First Summit um, is the 16th of June. The event upstairs is actually sponsored by Rubric. For myself, Mark Stephen, thank you. And a genuine thank you for turning out live today. We do appreciate it, and it is great to see people in the flesh again. Stay safe. Safe journey home. Thanks for watching.